This is a Digital Music Trans, episode 155, on the 24th of October 2013. This week on the show, Telefonica partners with Rhapsody, Twitter Music faces the axe, Playlists.net updates its iOS app, HMV pulls off a PR masterpiece, the new Letterman app, and iTunes Radio gets 20 million users in the first month. And this week's show is sponsored by media law firm Sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. Uh, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as audio and video on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcasters, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Trends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week it's a real pleasure to welcome back Steve Knopper on the show, author of several books including uh, Appetite for Self-Destruction which is pretty well known in the music industry and contributing editor at Rolling Stone. So hi, Stephen. Great to have you on. How's it going? Good. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to be back. It's great to have you. And also on the show today is a new arrival, Jules Parker from Polaroid Management. And before that, you were a PRS for quite some time. So hi, Jules. How's it going? Very good. It's a lovely day in London. Great. And so you, you work a lot with songwriters, right? I do. I, I manage songwriters and artists. So I work with uh, top liners, producers, and artists and bands. Yeah. Great. And uh, joining us once again, it's great to welcome back Alejandro Marin, uh, calling from Bogota, where he runs a great site of music and music industry news in Spanish, which is musicpimp.com. And he's also a radio DJ. And in fact, you can see him uh, if you're watching the video version of the show. He's uh, in uh, his radio studio. So hi, Alejandro, and great to have you on. How's it going? Hi, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me once again. And hi, thanks uh, for being here. I'm, I'm glad. And hello to Jules and Steve. It's great to have you guys. So uh, this week I'm going to start with a news that actually I was going to cover in the previous show because it just came out. But it's one of those news that I thought it was better to sit on it for a week and just see see what it means and trying to analyze it a bit more than just uh, covering it uh, as a as a sort of two, with a two hour notice. So uh, that's the news of uh, Telefonica, uh, which is a Spanish m- multinational telco which owns a number of carriers across uh, Europe and Latin America, uh, doing a deal with uh, uh, Napster and in turn with its uh, parent company, uh, Rhapsody. And uh, this deal will see the service uh, Napster bundled in a, a bunch of the carriers uh, that uh, Telefonica owns. Uh, so they're going to offer Napster as part of the service, as a bundle. Uh, and also uh, the company is uh, investing in uh, uh, Rhapsody as well. So it's becoming, uh, it's taking equity in the company, which is a very interesting move. So uh, Telefonica has uh, 317 million customers. At least this was uh, as of uh, June across 24 territories. So it's a huge carrier. And uh, although not all carriers uh, in Europe, for example, will be uh, uh, having Napster bundles, for example, in the UK, there's already a deal with a top 20 um, charts provider that provides the streams of of the um, uh, top 20 uh, every week. Uh, And uh, there's a deal with uh, Spotify, I think, in Spain with their counterpart. But for for a number of territories, uh, this deal will come come into play fairly soon. Uh, The interesting thing is that uh, Telefonica actually had their own streaming service. It was called uh, the Terra Sonora. That was especially popular, well, especially uh, used uh, in South America, and all of those uh, those users are going to be switched to uh, uh, Napster uh, as of the first of November. So uh, it's going to get a big bump of u- of users from the get go. So uh, first of all, uh, I-, I guess uh, we hear from Alejandro first uh, from uh, South America. W- you know, what do you think this deal means, and do you think uh, that uh, uh, Telefonica has the the clout, has the the power to? Uh, bring streaming uh, to South America and, and make a big spl- a splash with it? Well, I think Telefonica has made a very bold choice in uh, choosing uh, 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 Rhapsody Napster as their partner for entering the streaming business here in Latin America, and particularly in Colombia. Right. Uh, very first thing that caused my attention that I spoke to the Telefonica people right after we spoke uh, last week uh, really quickly on Twitter was... You know, I really don't get why Telefonica goes and picks uh, Rhapsody Napster as a partner for streaming here in Latin America uh, instead of picking Spotify, with which they already have a, a partnership in Spain. Right. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 again, like I said, very bold. I'm not really sure if they're going to be able to pull it off. They're the second largest carrier in Colombia, to be exact, you know, but right. uh, uh, Spotify already made it in Argentina. They came in without a, with, without a, a, a telephone carrier, a carrier uh, partnership. They're doing things on their own. I think they're also doing things on their own with, uh, with Mexico, and it really hasn't right. gone that well, you know, for Spotify. I'm, you know... 
maybe the the fact that Telefonica has got quite a lot of uh, uh, subscribers here in Colombia is going to help them out. But I also think that the trendsetters and those uh, uh, early adopters of streaming uh, services here in Colombia were expecting Telefonica to partner with uh, Spotify and they're actually waiting for Spotify to enter this market. And I right. believe that the time Spotify, and as soon as the Spotify enters this market, I think Rhapsody and Napster is going to be, you know, yesterday's news. Yeah. And, and, and Jules, do you think that it's, it might have to do with the uh, uh, costs as well? Because, I mean, I, I'm just wondering... Uh, thinking about the major players that are left in the field, and, and then I'm going to ask S S Steve about your thoughts on, on, on Rhapsody in North America, but uh, 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 Jules, uh, from your side, do you think that maybe this Rhapsody and Napster were the only player that was sort of in a bit of a pickle as to what they were going to do, and uh, perhaps uh, they, managed, they, they were willing to give away a, a bigger equity share to Telefonica in exchange for, for the deal? It definitely feels like that. I mean, for, yeah. for us, I mean, it's obviously different elsewhere, but in the, in the UK, they seem like a Kind of an ugly second cousin or Rhapsody and, and Napster to anything else, the other options that you have. So it, for me, it seems like a strange choice. I, I could only see that it would be worthwhile from a, you know, from a, an artist's point of view if, if streaming wasn't, if it didn't exist in the markets where it's going to be. But if, if um, as Alessandro says, you know, there's going to be Spotify there soon anyway, it does make it a strange choice if they're already partnering with someone, why they would go with someone else which probably, I, I don't know, Steve, you could probably tell us about the US, but I mean, Rhapsody is doing all right, but it's not exactly market leader over there, is it? So, No, that's, you're, you're correct, Jules, I agree with you. Um, yeah, I'm, Rhapsody, I feel bad for Rhapsody. I mean, I've used Rhapsody many times in the past, and it's always been a really good service. Like, they've always been a service that's sort of like, we're the quality service. We have the, uh, you know, kind of like e-music, you know, we have the editorial content, and we have all this stuff that, that for real music fans, and, and I think there's some credibility to that. Like, I've, I've always enjoyed my time with Rhapsody. But, you know, the Spotify model where it's sort of, like, free, you know, and, and, the, and, and it's got this sexiness to it, and it's got more music, and, and it's, it's just sort of taken over the market the way, you know, one could even say the way Facebook took over from Friendster, although Rhapsody probably wouldn't be thrilled about that comparison. You know? <laughs> but so, so, um, so yeah, my, my, upon reading this article, and, and I yield to Alejandro's um, direct, uh, yeah. uh, you know, knowledge of the market in, in South America, but um, I mean, my initial reaction about reading the article was, wow, Rhapsody and Napster are kind of desperate. Like they, they were unable to gain any foothold in the, in the US and to an extent Europe. And, and now they're just kind of like, we need something. We need to, I mean, not that, not that South America is small, but, but we need to make a deal so we can get something. Absolutely. And that's my guess as to what happened, which is kind of what Jules said as well. And, and if, I mean, we don't know how much, do we know how much they, they gave away in terms of equity? No. No, no. 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 I don't think that's out. So that's going to be you interesting. Know, whether, yeah, whether or not, you know, you know how much they gave, they gave in terms of equity would, another thing that you got to look at is how Deezer is behaving in this market, you know. Right. Yeah, these has been in this market for about a year now, and they they came in with Millicom. Uh, the, their carrier here is called Tigo. They're also in Central America. They've picked up, uh, you know, they've picked up the pace pretty fast in the past uh, three or four months in terms of marketing. They already have a marketing office here. They, you know, and they're doing things really well. Uh, Tigo's got about thirty five thousand subscribers here. This is a forty million people. Uh, uh, population uh, country. So, you know, 35,000 subscribers and uh, of them, you got 4,500 of them are premium plus subscribers. And, you know, many of those subscribers were actually waiting for Spotify to come in with Telefonica. So, and, and Rhapsody doesn't sound like Steve said, you know, it doesn't sound as sexy and it doesn't sound as interesting. And Napster is also linked to something that people here who are very conservative kind of like keep in mind, especially like the, like the old generations and it's the whole piracy deal, yeah. you know? So yeah. whether or not, you know, they have a lot of money invested or or not you know th what what really matters is that it doesn't look like a successful kind of thing you know yeah absolutely it's going to be a question of pricing as well like we we're talking about Alejandro uh, last time you were on uh, talking about hitting the right price spot for the uh, price spot for the right uh, territories that this is launching in South America as well and um, I wanted to ask you as well, Alejandro, uh, in terms of uh, Terra Sonora, because uh, I kind of I figured out there was something going on with uh, Terra Sonora when I was trying to get somebody uh, to come on my South by Southwest panel, 
uh, from Terra Sonora because I'm doing something about international markets and uh, uh, and so the idea was to get somebody from from Terra Sonora to talk about what they're doing over there and I couldn't find anybody it, it seemed like you know it kind of gone really quiet or, over there and so it, I, I felt like back in August there was something going on and, and this and this is definitely uh, what was going on the fact that you know that the service is shutting down but w why is that it was it just not a good service was it not working Okay, here's the deal with Terra Sonora. Terra Sonora is like a division, like you said before, of Telefonica Communications in terms of entertainment strategies and music strategies, to be more specific. So they had like, a, they, like uh, Sonora had a, a few branches uh, that, you know, came out of, th that stemmed out of that uh, entire uh, business strategy. One of them was concerts and live shows, live gigs. They wanted to be like their own promotion and entertainment uh, live entertainment company and the other one was they wanted to do streaming but they also had a download store so i think that they were doing too many things at a time yeah. and they were also like very confident on the fact that everything that was being developed on that platform which was the sonora platform was being developed for brazil which is a very isolated market when you compare it to whatever it is that's happening in Latin America and in South America in general. It's like right. Brazil. It doesn't look like it's a part of Latin America. You know, they don't speak the same language. Their culture is different. Their music market is completely different. They're very centered ar around the whole Brazil thing. And they thought that was actually going to work. But iTunes is really strong over there. And the streaming thing was not very helpful. The ecosystem that worked around Sonora didn't really help out as much. When they started pushing the idea forward to their other emerging markets, such as Colombia, Mexico, Central America, uh, they kind of, you know, the, the, we, we, like the, the, the Sonora people and the Telefonica people who were working for Terra here felt like they were being pushed around. You know, it was a very pushy kind of deal where, you know, the Brazilians were controlling everything that was happening in terms of entertainment. And once you got to the streaming platform, which we, many of us, you know, early adopters were actually waiting uh, to happen. When we got there, we found that there was not a lot of possible sharing going on. So if you went into the Sonora platform, you couldn't really share what you were listening to on Facebook. You can tell your friends about it on Twitter. And that really closed everything around the possible download business that was lurking in the shadows of iTunes in Sonora. So what happened was, you know, it, it was a total failure from the very beginning, you know, it, and it's very funny to see Telefonica make the same mistake again because I believe the whole the, 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 the whole the whole Rhapsody Napster thing is a big mistake if you want to fight the, the the giants and you know win or actually ha get have a chance have a shot at winning the streaming fight you know doesn't yeah. seem like a move for the future does it it seems like a move to the past it's yeah crazy. sure yeah, sure. I mean, I, if I think of Napster, I have I have sort of weirdly fond memories just because I remember that when I when the service went legal in the UK, and that was only it was only a couple of years after Napster actually got shut down. I think they reopened it as a legal streaming service. It was the first of its kind in the UK, and I remember I actually bought a, a, a proprietary MP3 player that was able to read the DRM files that uh, that you had to to get through it was through, through windows uh, some sort of w weird windows proprietary system and uh, i bought the mp3, MP3 player i was sus subscribed to napster for about a year i think and i was using it quite a lot i mean in the same way as we use spotify today but so i got fond memories of that because it was kind of a very first adopter type thing and i don't think that many people actually uh, caught on to that because you had to buy a device that was pretty buggy and didn't work very well but uh, but yeah so i've got kind of fond memories of napster and you know, I wouldn't be against seeing the brand come back. It's just a, a question of whether they can, uh, I think, at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. I think they're, I, they're pretty beat up, though. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but after everything that's happened, you know, that's another thing that I believe it's important to, to, to note and to talk about. And it's the fact that both brands, uh, Rhapsody and Napster, kind of like that, you know, one of them started, they sparked, you know, Napster sparked a revolution in terms of the way we consume and use music, you know, but, you know, they, I guess they got the short end of the stick in, in terms of what they bargained for at the, in the middle of the 2000s with the whole Lars Ulrich and, yeah. you know, all the whole legal fight and stuff. And Rhapsody, I believe, I don't know if Steve uh, agrees with me on this, but Rhapsody kind of like made it very early to the party, to the streaming right. party. Oh yeah, I mean, Rhapsody was was the early thing. That was the and and in fact, yeah. I mean, the last four or five years, 
as Spotify took off and all this other streaming stuff has happened and record labels would say in prominent New York Times articles, streaming is the future and all that stuff, people would just point to Net Rhapsody and say, yeah, but it's only like 2% of the market or 3 or 4% of the market, you know? And, and so Rhapsody was sadly, because it was a great service, was, was here in the U.S. at least, was, was kind of held up as sort of, well, we tried streaming, you know, and we've been trying it for years and it's not, it's not going to catch on. And it really took, um, you know, Spotify uh, and its success and frankly, its, its model of let's start with free and then yeah. let's yeah. Those people. That was sort of like the inflection point, I think. That was the point where people went, okay, th- we can see something happening with this. Users are, you know, really starting to be attracted to this and you're starting to pile up some numbers here. Whereas the nine ninety nine per month model, no matter how great the service was, was a turnoff for people, I think, and and Rhapsody became trapped into that model and kind of still is today, yeah. sadly. And and I say that with regret because I've always liked Rhapsody. Unlike you, Andre, I did not use that that early Napster streaming service. So so good on you for for trying it out. That's a funny story. Yeah, it's a funny story, and uh, and uh, I mean yeah, Rhapsody. I mean I've I've beaten up on Rhapsody pretty hard in past shows just because some of the features they come up with recently uh, are features that Spotify and, and Audio and Deezer have had for, for years now so I think like they only brought in offline caching literally like two or three months ago which is if that's your business and you've been doing it for so, so, such a long time it just doesn't feel like it's an acceptable thing to, to do this kind of delay. The, prob- the problem with Rhapsody is not the service as I see it the problem is the business model the problem right. is nine ninety nine a month is what you're going to pay just to get in and, but um, does yeah, it, that, but that's does, pretty reasonable, but, but doesn't do, does it, doesn't uh, Pandora have the same thing? And they they sound like they're very successful, or at least more successful than Rhapsody. Pandora is free. That's yeah, Pandora is free. I mean, oh, okay. You just right. get an app and, right. and off you go. And same thing with iTunes Radio. So so I mean that's I mean sadly for the record labels, you know, and to an extent artists, the the, the model is we got to have some huge element of free. In, or, in order to keep it, compete with piracy because otherwise people are just going to download all this stuff for free. And that's really the bottom line. And for years, Rhapsody was waving that flag of, yeah, but we have a great service, just nine ninety nine. Who wouldn't want to pay nine ninety nine for all nine ninety nine for all the world's music? You know, come on guys. And yeah, it sounds, believe- it sounds to me like we're going back to the Columbia house music club, but on digital yeah. <laughs> where they told you, you yeah. where they told you, you, you only paid like 99 cents for 12 CDs, you know, yeah. And somewhere along the way, you were actually spending a lot of money on music. You know, <laughs> I still have some old records from that deal. That's in a trunk right over there. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too, man. That's you always take it on cassette and then send them back. You know, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The sending back always drove me crazy. <laughs> and if you don't send them back, they're going to charge you fifty bucks or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, you know, um, I think it's uh, it's an interesting story, and uh, definitely going to be interested in seeing uh, how that progresses for Telefonic. I mean, there is even the chance that if they if they if they subsidize the service enough, then maybe it will be a success. Who knows? Uh, and uh, moving on, uh, I wanted to talk about Twitter music, and uh, you know, we've been beating up, beating up on Twitter music quite a bit uh, on the show uh, ever since you know we saw that from the third week of launch onwards, uh, the trajectory was of that of a decline, unfortunately, instead of a climb. And so you know, the, the much hyped. Uh, uh, app released by Twitter uh, after making a big splash when it launched uh, because it had uh, so, so many uh, first class uh, artists and you know A-listers uh, promoting it and talking about it uh, you know after a couple of weeks it started plummeting through the charts and now the reports from All, Thing- All Things D are that uh, Twitter is considering shutting down the app completely so uh, the only thing I wanted to talk about on this particular story because uh, you know it's we have talked about it quite a bit is talk about the entry point of Twitter music as a service so the way that Twitter put it out there as a as a, as a story, so do you think, uh, like Jules, for example, do, do do you feel like if Twitter had held back a little bit with uh, this service and released it as a, as a beta product and allowed people to play with it and seeing what the reaction was, it would have had a better chance to actually build an audience through that through iterations instead of going, this is amazing, it's the best thing ever, and we're gonna make a splash with it. It's gonna be the best music experience, and then people just kind of all went to get it and they went, oh well, okay, it's yeah, samples I mean- and. To be honest, I mean, it, it, the launch actually passed me by. I mean, I, right. I knew it happened. I knew that, that one day We Are Hunted, which I loved using, yeah. just didn't work. And it says, hey, go and, go and check out Twitter Music. And it, it didn't seem to be, and I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's very difficult to keep up with every kind of, everything that comes <laughs> up all the time. Yeah. Now, Twitter Music seemed important. But then after a while, it, it kind of passed me by that you had to be, 
in something else. You know, it's not just in Twitter. You have to have this other thing. And that just seemed really pointless because wh- why would you then call it Twitter music if it's not actually within Twitter? It doesn't yeah. make any sense because there's such a powerful medium there. So why don't you use that somehow? And it, it, I don't know. It all seemed really fragmented. I didn't really have time to look into it too much. Sure. I just lamented the fact that I still have We Are Hunted on Spotify and I couldn't use it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, their launch was perhaps bigger in the States because then didn't they do it on, it was a daytime TV? They did it. They did also, yeah, all sorts of promotions on around it, yeah. Um, and then they had big stars, but I mean, I don't know whether those, the, the people they co-opted to, to actually promote it knew exactly what they were promoting. <laughs> I think it took everyone a little while to realize actually what it meant. Yeah. And it, when people realized it, they went, oh, okay, which is why, you know, it was in the, 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 the top rankings of the, of the app store and then quickly plummeted. It's yeah. like, well, okay, well, we don't know how we can use this. I think that's probably where everyone else is. We, we go, how can we use this to promote? How can we use this for people to find stuff? I, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if they're going to revamp it now, brilliant. If they're going to do it within Twitter itself, then fantastic. I'd love to see what they come up with. I know they've got Bob Moz over there now, yeah. um, so I'd love to see what he uh, comes up with. And, and so, Steve, do you think that it's the only now with this big launch that didn't work? Is is the only road to shut down the app and start from scratch? I don't know. Um, I I agree with Jules' conclusion, but um, I kind of came at it in the opposite way. Like I, I was actually assigned a story for Rolling Stone um, when when uh, Twitter Music first first launched, and um, kind of wrote this flattering sort of yeah, this is kind of a cool discovery tool, you know, obligatory kind of piece because I tried it out and I, I actually really liked it. And and in fact, I'm I'm sort of looking for a better tool for discovery. I know there's a lot out there, but you know, we are all, all are trying to personalize our, you know, what, what kind of music is coming out that we like. And, and I'm, I'm struggling with that like everyone else. Right. So I thought, and I like Twitter and I look at my Twitter feed all the time. And, and I thought this was a natural, I thought, I thought it worked fine. And, um, you know, I'm not sure the launch or the hype from the launch really was the issue from, from the, the only source I have like you is, is the all things D article. And it suggests that, Twitter had some personnel changes and some management changes, and then they started to de-emphasize Twitter music internally, and right. and then it got kind of left, kind of hung out to dry, so to speak. Um, yeah. And that seems I don't know if that's true. I haven't talked to the Twitter people, but um, that seems consistent. It seems like this was a potentially good thing, um, and and had a lot of artists and and a splashy publicity campaign. And then poof, it just disappeared. And I completely forgot about it, just like everybody else. Yeah. You know, that's why I say I agree with you, Jules. Like it's like, yeah. you know, I was like, oh, this is cool. I'll probably use this. Then it was like, oh wait, six months later, I haven't used it once. You know, so yeah. so that's not a good thing for for every. I mean, especially for someone like us, yeah. for people like us who are really into this. You know, it, that's yeah. a bad thing if you're not if you're not catching us. Yes, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Uh, Alejandro, do you feel like uh, Twitter? Twitter is such a powerful force. Do you feel like it, it has more to give to the music industry than what it's doing at the moment? Uh, you you know what I think that's funny about this whole Twitter music sharing down thing is the fact that, you know, the leaders on Twitter and the guys who have the most followers are all artists. You know, it's like you got the Gagas and the Justin Biebers and they're all moving the traffic forward. So it's kind of funny and it kind of looks like the very same Telefonica thing where, you know, they want to get into the business because they know it's a part of their strategy and it could make big bucks for them. But they're clueless as to what people really want, you know, in term in, in terms of music, and it's very interesting to see. I'm not, you know, Colum- Twitter music never really worked in Colombia for rights reasons. You know, it was sure. like an it, it, it was uh, it was restricted it was limited to, to Spotify and Audio, wasn't it? So yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, that was the reason why it didn't really work. Audio is, hasn't made it. You know, Ardia just came into this market like right. three months ago. Their very first uh, apps were kind of buggy with the with the Android devices here. I don't know why. It was kind of heavy, the whole thing. They haven't been very much uh, uh, proactive in terms of marketing, so people don't know them yet. Right. And uh, Deezer's picked up a lot of pace in terms of how, how the streaming technology is going. Now, as of what Twitter can do, uh, for the music industry beyond engagement, I'm not really sure. I don't think it's very viral in terms of uh, the content that those big stars and hotshots of the music industry who are being, you know, like pushed forward by the great record companies are, you know, I don't, I don't think that they can do anything beyond just talking to their fans and kind of making it look like there's a close relationship between the fan and the musician. Because in terms of virality, 
in terms of uh, content, in terms of numbers, and in terms of music per se, I think YouTube is king. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, as uh, Steve, you're talking about uh, finding an app that really engages people and uh, um, creating a good discovery experience. And uh, an app that I wanted to talk about this week, just because uh, they just relaunched, and I, I thought that the app was actually pretty good. And uh, uh, I just wanted to talk about it. Uh, was the new playlists.net iOS app, which uh, came out uh, uh, last week uh, or early this week. I'm not sure. I'm losing track of time. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so it's uh, a playlist.net. Uh, if you're not aware of it, it used to be called Share My Playlists. And uh, it was a popular. It's a popular website uh, for sharing playlists uh, uh, exclusively on Spotify at the moment. They don't have any cross-platform uh, uh, options uh, yet. And so they went from being a website to having a Spotify app, uh, which was also very successful. Uh, and uh, uh, now they've uh, updated the iOS application. Uh, to provide a host of new features uh, uh, to help people navigate through the, uh, I think it's 145,000 playlists that they have on the on the playlist on a site now. So you can navigate by genre, you can navigate by the most popular playlists, you can navigate by mood, you can geolocate and pin playlists to specific places. So uh, one of the cool things is that you can, for example, if you go to the gym, you can pin uh, a gym playlist uh, there. Other people can do that, and then you can also explore their playlists if you go to the to the gym and see if other people have shared playlists that they work out to. So uh, it seems like a very interesting uh, uh, way of going about it. I mean, of course, it's one of many apps that are trying to do this. Uh, but uh, you know, do you feel like there is a, an opportunity for an underdog, uh, you know, that is not a big corporate uh, a company, to come in and actually disrupt this market in, in this way? I'm not sure it's if if uh, playlist.net is is a disruption kind of service. Um, right. I think, but I think it's useful as a tool to help people with discovery. And you know, I I, I haven't really tried playlist.net, frankly, and and I should. Um, and and I'll just tell you about briefly about my own sort of habits, which is that I will spend hours just tinkering and curating my own music collection, whether it's you know physical CDs or or iTunes or whatever it is, and like changing the metadata around and making sure, you know, it doesn't say just track to track, whatever it is, you know, I'll spend hours on this process. And yet for discovery, when I want to find a new, mu a new song or a new album that I want to buy or, or, or listen to on Spotify or whatever, I want that to be quick. Like right. I, I don't want to tinker with anything. I don't, I don't, you know, I just want to turn on the, maybe it's just because of my old, old school radio listening habits. You know, I just want to turn something on and go, I like that song. Right. Or read a playlist by a friend who I trust, or a rock critic, or whoever that I trust. I want that to be fast. So for, I don't know if people are like this in general. I suspect maybe they are only because we're all ingrained to have these habits of sort of buying is a cumbersome process, and you know discovery is sort of like you turn on the radio and it works. So I think that might be ingrained or, or natural to most people. So yeah. that's a long way of saying this whole idea of tinkering with something like playlist.net and syncing it with Spotify might be a reach for, for most people. Um, it seems like it is for me and, and I'm pretty into this stuff. So, so that's why I, I just generally speaking, I might question whether, you know, this is a disruption model or whether it gets big or if it remains sort of like just a cool niche that a few people use. Yeah. You know, I, I was actually turned on to it by, um, by the people at Spotify here. Who were actually, um, you know, just just recommended doing it for one of one of the artists that I'm working with. He's he's a Swedish guy, and he's he's got a lot of traction with his first single. So the idea was, okay, we'll create his own playlist to kind of create his own little world, and and that seems to be starting to work. It's very early days, but we're trying to create something on you know playlist.net and actually have his own playlist there that's that's both promoted there and on Spotify, and actually that's hopefully a way into his own stuff. So hopefully we can engage people who already like his material to listen to more stuff that's that he likes and is in the same vein. And then obviously when he has a new release, we can put something in there, and then that goes out to more more listeners. Hopefully, so hopefully I'm, I'm hoping it could be a good promotional tool, just one little bit in, in the rest of it. Absolutely. And I, and I was quite a, for example, there was a, um, a playlist that Willie Mason put out. I think it was with a, some of his stuff and then some of the stuff that of the people that he's been on the road with uh, for the last few years. And that, that was a really great way for him to, sort of, I think, showcase some of his stuff, but also showcase things by people that work within the same vertical genre and people that like him would like as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think in that sense, it works very well. Uh, Alejandro, on your on your on your front, of course, you work in radio, so uh, playlists are kind of your bread and butter as well. <laughs> so, w right. w you know, how do you feel about the playlists market uh, today? And uh, do you feel like uh, 
the, the rise of an app like playlist on that also signifies the fact that the, the main players like Spotify are not doing a good enough job to allow people to uh, curate and share playlists. I can't speak much for Spotify because Spotify hasn't made it in here legally. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of hacking going on regarding Spotify. You know, there's a lot of people using like international IPs and stuff to actually, you know, update their 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 playlists and stuff i know that they do a pretty good job you know because i've seen the app and i've seen many of the brands and i've seen many of the like the pitchfork apps and the rolling stone apps and i see that they do a fantastic job at curating um in terms of these are these are just beginning to pick up the pace uh, in that sense they're just beginning to you know uh, get together with brands like magazines they just uh, closed the deal with Esquire magazine here in Colombia and they you know they're going to have a special channel they're right. beginning to talk to celebrities and disc jockeys who are curating playlists and like sending them over to Twitter and you know they're they're having the, 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 I, I guess you know that it's a, it's a quite a it's quite an interesting tool it's quite an interesting uh uh possibility for music and for radio aficionados and stuff i'm not really sure uh, you know the, the the app that you're talking about i haven't tried it i'm gonna try it of course <laughs> you know i'm gonna see i'm gonna see how it works but i think yeah. that you know creating playlists and sharing them on different social networks is just it's it's a thrill you yeah. know it's 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 great it's a it's a great way to connect with people to actually get you know your digital followers to you, you grow. It's it's a great way for radio to uh, diversify. You know, I think that as well as podcasting and, and audio on demand, which I'm not. I don't know what Steve and Jules think about this. Uh, this, but I think that in terms of radio, radio should be more connected to those digital audiences. And one way to do it is to actually start off by creating and curating their own playlists, and then maybe in uh, the long run actually having some of those listeners, you know, curate those playlists and see them, you know, projected or, or on the airwaves as well as the on-demand content, which I think, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I think that on-demand content is also very exciting, a very exciting thing to do for radio. I don't know what you guys think about it, but I think that the next step for terrestrial radio, whether it's talk or music, should actually, uh, you know, be letting you know, leaving those uh, available things that are happening on the air for all the digital digital listeners out there, as well as the playlists. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, I, I think. I, that, oh, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, so I was just going to say that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're kind of digressing here, but um, I mean, if I could That's pick fine. my ultimate radio and and discovery matched with ownership experience. It would be in my car. <laughs> right. It would be, you know, I listen to the world's best radio stations, you know, which I think Sirius XM, at least here in the States, you know, is, is probably something close to that. And then I want a button where when I hear a song I like on the radio, I push this button in my car and then it goes to a playlist. And then I have this playlist everywhere. And then I have this direct sort of discovery leading to curation, leading to ownership kind of system and then every you know and i could constantly be be tinkering with this this great playlist that i'm hearing from these radio djs so all of these services to me i mean again this is my own personal perspective but all of these services are sort of building up to that spotify plus facebook plus youtube plus what's available in your car and bluetooth and all that you know all this stuff it's it's all building up to that I, at least i hope and so I'm thinking, you know, I'm I'm happy with the way digital music is now. We have we're we're way better off than we were ten years ago when when Andrea was listening to uh, to Napster streaming, you know. <laughs> but, but it wasn't uh, actually streaming; it was you had to download the files onto oh, the device, okay. so you weren't oh, actually, yeah. Okay. Right, right, okay, right. So that's why you had that MP3 player. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, we're it's no longer primitive. It's it's an easy experience and it's fun and it's like you know these are. These are first world problems, right? You know, so so it's no big deal. But but if I had to pick sort of what I would, where I would like this to lead, that would be my personal preference as a listener. Right, and I think you still got to have the, you know, the the fact that you don't know what's coming up. That for me is the is the magic of, of radio. Yeah. I, I love yeah. listening to radio. I actually don't want to know what's coming up because I'm I'm just kind of I have so much choice. I just want to hear stuff. You know, I don't I don't want to know what's coming up. I want to just listen to the radio. I want to hear stuff there's obviously there's times where you want to hear something specific but actually yeah. if you just want to listen to the radio or listen to music you just want it to be there and you, you want it to find stuff that way because it's nice to have other people choose stuff for you and you don't actively have to do anything to do that and that's why yeah. I, 
playlist is good as long as you don't have to choose what's on the playlist. <laughs> and I think, and I think that's one of the most exciting things about all these new music services. You know, the fact that radios become a little bit boring and predictable, and and, the, and especially like top forty kind of radio, whatever it is that's happening on. American radio markets and uh, the way clear channels like taken over the entire music radio thing is reflected upon what big radio conglomerates in Latin America do, which is pretty much just go by the numbers, pick the best 40 songs out there that are, you know, pitched by the gatekeepers and, you know, keep on moving, you know, that's pretty much it. And that has, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, taken a lot from radio in terms of its sexiness, its uh, uh, its surprise factor, and that you can uh, capitalize with playlists and services such as Spotify, services such as RDO or Deezer or whatever it is that you use. The fact that you can actually get people to be excited about something that maybe doesn't belong on the radio yet could actually become a potential hit or maybe just a personal favorite that uh, you want to share with someone else now there's still that little uh, breach in the contract that you have as a dj with your listener and it's the fact that when you do a playlist all you can do is just send the playlist over through your twitter account through your fan page through uh, your web page and whatnot but there isn't really like an editorial position that people are hearing and that's where i think that on demand stuff comes in the fact that you right. can actually create an editorial playlist and then after that, share with share it with the rest of the world is one of the biggest tools that you know uh, curators should work on uh, in Spotify and in Deezer. That's why I think that you know there's a long way to go for the streaming services. Yeah, and you know, and, and I, we forget I think in in the UK how lucky we are to have some of these the BBC radios over here that you know they have the freedom to take risks and they and we have six music and we have one extra and we have uh, all the in the new music we trust. Uh, shows so you can actually hear new stuff you can hear things that people are taking a chance on and say well with a playlist uh, six music playlist i have that as a playlist on uh, on spotify so that gets updated by someone called billy i don't know who that is but he, that's his playlist and it, and it just has the songs that are added to the to the, the the six music playlist every week and it's great you get it and you listen to it and it's yeah it's nice to have that yeah, you you know what's what's exciting? You guys got the best radio in the world, by the way. You know, we're big fans of BBC Radio 1 and 2 and 6 here. You know, we listen to them every week and every day and we'll check out their playlist. By the way, you, you, you got to meet Andrea. You got to meet Zane Lowe, didn't you? Yeah, there was a, a launch of this uh, playlist uh, playlist tool. So that's something that you're probably oh, yeah. going to be interested in as well, uh, Alejandro, yeah. from, from your end, because they are providing essentially a first step towards what you were talking about, which is uh, trying to uh, connect the, the terrestrial radio space with the online radio space and allowing people to create playlists out of the tracks they hear on the radio and then export those back into the services that they've chosen to use. Uh, uh, so like uh, at the moment, they have deals with uh, um, partnerships with uh, Spotify and Deezer and the YouTube, so you can export those playlists back into those services. So that's that's a very interesting uh, a new uh, concept uh, that uh, at the moment is web-based only, so that might be a, a bit of a snag at the moment, just in terms of adoption uh, for the mainstream public. Uh, but I think you know if they develop it and invest it in it as much as they say they will, I think that's going to be a very interesting tool for for the future of radio, at least as at least as a as a pilot program. And then I'm sure other other companies are going to come in and and try and copy it from a corporate. Side, right. but because the BBC has money to take risks like that, and you know, they're very clever people. So that's that's I think that's that's really cool. And when it comes to playlists, I, I think that uh, uh, Beats is also, you know, that they're they're pitching their whole Beats idea uh, on curation and right. all that stuff, right, Steve? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, Beats hasn't quite given all the details of, of what their service is going to be like, but uh, but yeah, that's what I understand is it, it's going to be very, very much oriented to that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just wanted to say that, yeah, sure. that what, uh, what Jules was saying about radio a minute ago was very inspirational, and now I've got that Velvet Underground song in my head. You know, every time <laughs> she turned on the radio, she couldn't believe what she heard at all, and I was thinking about playing it, but I don't want to have any copyright. Concerns. I know exactly. <laughs> T take down. I feel so bad. Like every week, I have artists that email me asking if I could feature a song on the, sh on the show and I, I, like, I would love to but then I, I go on the PRS and 
stuff and start looking into the fees and things that are attached to having music on podcasts and it's just not feasible for me right now to to have that expense so it's like I should, I, I can't, kickstarter I, man. I know kickstarter <laughs> <laughs> help me help me get music on the show by paying my, my <laughs> by paying my fees <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so no, definitely an interesting, an interesting debate on that, and uh, uh, very excited to see what's going to happen with the, the playlist as well in the UK. And after the break, we're going to talk about Apple's latest announcements and iTunes Radio's numbers. But first, a short information piece recorded with this week's sponsor, media law firm Sheridan's. And this is the last installment of a series, and so I'd like to thank them for their support of Digital Music Trends over the last couple of months. And if you'd like to hear more from Tahir, please visit the DMT's YouTube channel. I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir, and it's great to be talking about uh, digital service providers today. It's our last segment of a uh, five-segment uh, series. So, uh, hi Tahir, and great to have you on. Thanks, as ever, for having me on again. And so, uh, we're going to talk about timing, uh, first of all. So, uh, I've been on a startup before, and timing is essential uh, in the way you structure your business, because uh, a lot of these content deals can take a long time, you know, six months to a year, uh, to achieve enough content deals to actually be able to launch a service. And so, how do you structure your business to survive these timings, uh, given that they can be so extended and kind of unpredictable as well? Yeah, um, I think the first thing is that the founders of the business uh, should be realistic about the timing that these deals take. Make sure that they have uh, someone who's helping them to kind of speed things up. So as a lawyer, you know, I, I very much uh, appreciate the fact that acceleration is really important. And if you're yeah. doing things too slowly, that's a death knell in the business. Um, so trying to keep things moving quickly, reacting um, and not sitting on things. Uh, but from the business's perspective, make sure your team is structured the right way. So Typically with a digital service provider, make sure that you know, if you're hiring people, well, tr try and keep it lean, but if you're hiring people, those are the people that you need at that particular time. So for example, when you first start, you tend to have more technology uh, individuals uh, working on the product themselves. As it grows and you've got the product right, then you move to the sales and marketing team. Um, and the technology team tends to reduce at that point. Um, so structuring that the right way is really important because otherwise you've got people who've got skill sets that are not being used. Yeah. From a lawyer's perspective, um, you know, some of the things that I try and do is uh, make sure that uh, you know, I, I've sat in with the team you know, whilst they're building the product, uh, just to understand the product well and point out any kind of dead ends, uh, put together our own deal terms. I think that's quite important because sometimes you can react to um, deal terms which are provided to you which don't fit your model. So if you can have your own deal terms which you can present, that at the very least, will speed up the negotiations. Yeah. Um, and, and in best, they'll get accepted. Yeah, sure. um, so, yeah. That's great. And talking about the, you know, we're talking about your role as, as a law firm, and, uh, what's the best way for them to, to make use of, of your time or, or, or any law firm's time and make sure that they maximize that time so that they don't end up spending a huge amount of money uh, and you know, end up without the results they need? Yeah, uh, the communication with the lawyers are important. Yeah. So if you've got the whole team talking to the lawyer all the time, that's expensive. So make sure you uh, you focus who is actually dealing with the lawyers. Usually it's the business development person or the person responsible for licensing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I act for um, uh, technology companies which are not to do with music, and they still have the same types of issues. So there's, you know... The investment, you know, getting those investment deals, get the money in, there's the rights, there's the building of the business, the employment aspects. So from a lawyer's perspective, what are the things that we can do to help? Um, we can help point out the types of issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, we can help analyze the model from a, from a, a legal rights perspective. We can help, you know, the right lawyers, we can help uh, introduce to investors and to content owners the right people. So you're speeding up that uh, process and uh, they're dealing with the right people. But Thank you very much and uh, thanks for this interesting uh, uh, comments on, on digital service providers. I, I hope uh, listeners are going to find them I'm sure they're going to find them really interesting. Yeah, I wish we had more time because there's so many more things to talk about but yeah, it's been good. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. And uh, talk, uh, talking about uh, you know, funny stories. Uh, I, I was going to mention this uh, whole HMV saga that happened this week. Uh, this is uh, absolutely hilarious. So um, HMV has had an interesting couple of weeks. They're really trying to push uh, to rebrand themselves as a company that's doing cool things and is finally coming out of this rut that they've been in the last few years. Uh, you know, they have a new chairman, Paul McGowan, who is uh, trying to be quite hip. You know, he had a 
five point plan that he outlined on uh, the enemy of all places uh, uh, three weeks ago and we talked about it on the show as well uh, then you know they went on to announce the release of an iOS and Android uh, uh, new apps uh, where they actually rehash the digital service uh, that, uh, of HMV that had been uh, of course uh, sh- shuttered uh, when the, the the company started going down essentially and uh, you know now they announced the features like scan and buy so you can go in a store with the HMV app you can scan at the barcode of a CD and you are able to buy that uh, from the digital app instead of buying the physical CD uh, you, you can do audio fingerprinting so that's all cool stuff but it's all been done before but the, the really funny thing is that they in the app that they released for iOS they actually managed to sneak in a function that allowed users to buy the track and actually download it directly into their iTunes uh, of their of their devices which is something that nobody has really managed to do uh, as of yet and uh, I, I'm sure the Apple's guidelines are really strict in that respect so uh, so what happened is that they, they somehow managed to get this app approved uh, and then of course Apple realized what was happening and they uh, said you know you have to change this app by uh, I don't know 6 p.m. or there was a deadline for it and uh, you know they didn't and so uh, Apple took the app down uh, for the time being so that's a quite an interesting story because of course you know I think I, I would have any, any person that works in the music industry in, in the digital music industry would have told them that Apple would have not approved this function I mean it's it's pretty well known that nobody can access that file system of the of iTunes without getting into some sort of trouble uh, but it was funny that they used that then to create an uproar saying why is Apple not allowing us to do that it's pulled up pulled down the app and they've done all this noise about it so I guess they achieved a couple of things on the one side they allowed the HMV to make headlines everywhere with the story and uh, I'm sure they're going to do headlines as well when they put the app back on the store and they're going to have much more recognition for it uh, once they do and the, on the other side it puts the issue back in play as to who controls the ecosystem and whether uh, Apple is at a point where they should start allowing uh, other uh, sellers of music to uh, allow people to download MP3s right to their devices. So, I don't know, was this just a PR stunt? Is there something more behind it? Uh, Jules, what are your thoughts on it? You know what, I I don't actually... um... I mean, HMV is, is an interesting brand. You know, we, we all love it because it's, it, you know, it's where most people bought their first, their first music, the first CDs. But as a, as a digital provider, right. I mean, I, I was actually surprised to hear how many or how much there was a supposed take up of the app because A, it's HMV and B, it's through, through your phone. I, I don't know. I, 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 it just wouldn't be something I'd particularly do. And I wouldn't be looking for something, uh, an option for you know, for myself to download music through HMV. So I wondered who was actually doing that. Yeah, and, me too. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I am uh, just as uh, uh, kind of uh, unaware as you are as to who is, was actually using this app. But, uh, but to get this straight, so you, you would have to walk into an HMV and point your phone at an album uh, cover. That, that's one of then, the functions they and have. Then and then the song goes to your... I mean, isn't that a little bit indirect? Like, no, actually, no, I mean, that, that's one of the functions. Like, that's only one of the functions. I mean, you can search on it uh, as a normal MP3 store as well, but one of the functions was to be able to go and do that. Got it. Okay. I, I just we don't have HMV here in the US really, so so I'm a little out of the loop on this. But exactly. it reminds me of um, you know that 1999 2000 phase when Tower Records was kind of going, hey, we should get online. You know, <laughs> we should do you know, and and uh, and it was like, yeah, let's try this online service, and they weren't able to really get anything from the labels and. They didn't have any tech people to make the service any good, and it sort of was a failure even before it started. And I just feel like, you know, sadly, because I love record stores and always have, I I feel like record stores are not, and retailers are not where you're going to look to for innovation in the the digital music space necessarily. I mean, or, maybe there's, or maybe there's an untapped market there. Maybe we don't know all these people. Maybe there's somewhere. Who knows? Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess when I'm shopping in a record store and I go, well, I can't actually buy, you know, it's, I don't want to buy the $18 CD. I'll just, you know, mm. click on the phone and get the $10 MP3 version. I guess that's practical, but it seems a little bit backwards. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of a self-cannibalization that we're talking about in uh, some of the articles yeah. that I read on this. But uh, at the same time, it's also like, I don't think anybody in their right mind would think that they can launch... I mean, maybe they can, but I don't know. I'm just uh, thinking on the top of my head. Uh, it's just so expensive to maintain a digital music store of that proportion that I just can't think that they would make enough money to even cover the costs of running that. So whether that's just a way to get people in the doors to the store or revitalize the brand... But I, I'm just not sure whether they could ever make the money back, even if the store took off to a certain degree. I mean, Amazon has got 
uh, still probably a single digit or if like a very low double digit uh, market share in MP3 sales these days and they've invested so much money in it. HMV could probably make a dent of like what one two percent if they were lucky and how many sales are those? So yeah, it just seems like a really weird move. They should I have tried just doing the 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 independent record store kind of thing, but you know, making it cool for the brand. They should just turn it turn you know music buying and going to music stores into a cool experience. You know, like branding the stores and having artists come in and signing uh, things like the McCartney thing, which I think that happened last week in the UK in in an HMV store. But just make it really big and colorful and exotic and you know as fun as it sounds doing an independent record store in the US. You know, it's like every time you 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 go on Twitter and you hear. That independent record store is going on in the U.S. You know, you you really want to be a part of that. You know, you want to be a part of the record. You know, the the, the record collectors. You know, you want to be a part of that. And Absolutely. and I also think that there is something that can still be done about just in general the connection between mu digital music and physical music. And so far, I think really effectively in a way that works. We've only seen that with on the artist level. Like you know, a few years ago when Nine Inch Nails put out that album you know, and said, you can have this for free, but if you want like the cool physical box set, you have to go to a record store and buy it for 99 bucks or whatever. Like that stuff is effective. I think the idea of sort of luring someone into a new artist or a cool product with a cheap digital way of luring them in is in, and getting them into buying something physical is, is effective. Um, I think there's maybe something there. I think there's maybe a model there for somebody, but I don't think this is it. I don't think what H HMV is. It, it seems sort of desperate to me. Right. Right. Is it still working on the Android? Uh, yeah, as far as I, I know, it is. Yeah, as far yeah. as I know, there's no, there's no issues there because I think it's pretty open, so uh, you can do pretty much whatever you want. I'm kind of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm so in entrenched in the iOS environment, and I've spent so much money on apps that I keep, I keep thinking that I should really make the move, but I just can't find the courage to like pull the plaster <laughs> off of. <laughs> <laughs> of my wounded to do that so uh yeah we're gonna have to see uh, wait and see uh, i think the prices of the new ipads might have uh, tipped me into the android direction <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're pretty expensive but uh, but yeah so it's it's an interesting story and uh, i wanted to move back to the states uh, steve uh, and uh, ask you quickly about uh, there's a uh, there was a, a story last week that i didn't cover which is it was the launch of the new uh, david letterman uh, uh app uh for, from cbs so uh David Letterman, of course, is a huge uh, show in the States. Uh, they have a lot of musical guests. And so what did, what did they do? They decided to have an app that was featuring uh, all, the all the videos that were recorded uh, during the David Letterman show, also extras and all sorts of other stuff uh, so that users could browse through that and, and have a great experience. So uh, that's pretty cool because, you know, of course, uh, some of these shows get a lot of very high caliber artists and it's the same in the uk with some of the the big shows on the on the main channels on, on friday and saturday night and so you know but, but at the same time it raises the question of whether there is a need for this sort of uh, app so uh, when there is youtube and most of this stuff is on there so just wanted to ask your thoughts on whether it makes sense for somebody like cbs to release an app for music on letterman it's great for music and it's great for the music industry but is it going to drive any engagement yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't tinkered with the app yet, and it's still new. Um, I, I think that probably a lot of that has to do with um, which artists who play Letterman give them the rights to do that. Right. Um, you know, so so if Springsteen plays Letterman, I, you know, I, my guess is he probably is going to be very restrictive in terms of which performances he lets be used on the app. Whereas right now, you know, the names I see mentioned in this story, like Gatye and, and Adele and The Killers, you know, th those are all, Mar Mumford and Sons, those are all big artists. but. Right you know, are they going to be sort of the legendary performances that, that, you know, that, that Letterman has been known for over the years? I don't know. And the other thing is, you know, you mentioned YouTube. I mean, my guess is that the Letterman show and CBS probably sees this as a play to drag some of the, you know, less authorized YouTube audience, which is sort of putting up these unauthorized clips and some kind of authorized clips, you know, over to this official app. And we've seen this picture before, right? We've, we've seen, you know, music industry people try to say, or, you know, it, it happens a lot with, with scalping in, in the ticket market. You know, it's like, if we, if there's all this unauthorized stuff taking place and making money, then let's lure it over to this spot, ticketmaster.com or, you know, this Letterman app where we have, we have control over it and we can make money off of it. So, so it could be effective in that way, but I don't, I don't know if I see it as a game changer or, or any, you know, gigantic thing, at least yet. 
it yeah. seems very specific as well, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, for, for from the from the UK perspective, uh, Jules, do you think that there would be some value in having the BBC, for example, collate all the uh, performances from uh, the Graham Norton show and have an app that goes out to the wider public uh, to showcase those artists? And would that be a positive thing? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I guess you'd have to pick and choose where those performances were. I think things like the Live Lounge on Radio One, they work. Right. You know, and they've started, you know, streaming them as well as as, as taking it, and the and the, the albums that that were, you know, collection of those performances have done really well. I think that that kind of thing works. Individual performances from individual shows. It just it all seems just so specific. I I, right. I don't know whether anyone would, or, or else that a very small market would be bothered to download that app for that one specific purpose. Yeah. I think if the BBC did something where you had access to loads of different performances, like you know old. Top of the Pops or Grey Whistle Test or, 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 you know, later with Jules Holland performances, maybe that would be good. That'd be great. Obviously, that's a huge undertaking, but <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. that would be, uh, that would be <laughs> Alejandro, I, I would imagine you have similar shows in Colombia as well, where there's like maybe one or two stars that, or, or musicians that come and play a few songs per show. Uh, and, you know, do you think that's something that people just find on YouTube? Uh, how do they consume it afterwards? Yeah, I, you know, I think that YouTube is perfect for those kinds of things. Whether yeah. I don't think that if 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 you're a savvy uh, businessman on entertainment, you'd be able to capitalize everything that you do on YouTube and make sure that you clear every right rights issue with the rights holders before right. you 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 get on a business with that. But in terms of TV and music here, you know, we're very far behind. And one of the reasons why uh, we're far behind in terms of entertainment television here is engineering. You know, you look at things like Jules Holland on TV and on, you know, cable television here, and you say, wow, man, I mean, this guy is really, you know, he really understands what music is all about. And it, it, it's a, it's an exciting TV thing to watch as well as the, letterman uh, performances which you know like i think that i'm not really sure if 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 it's uh, as exciting as it was back when i was a kid when i was 14 or 15 years old and i saw my favorite artist on letterman i don't think it's as exciting as as uh, as it was before but go going back to the engineering thing you know we don't have good sound engineers here who can actually pull something off on you know free on you know air tv uh, you know, whether or not it happens on YouTube, I think it's a waste of time right now as long as we don't have, you know, Quality. the engineering the engineering right. skills to pull something off on the tools that already exist. That's interesting, actually, to, to think about it from a technical perspective as well. Yeah, that, that you wouldn't think there would be those challenges anymore, but there definitely are. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so moving on to the last story of the day, I just wanted to close by talking about Apple. So, of course, uh, yesterday was a big announcement uh, that left me drooling for a new Mac Pro, which uh, uh, is uh, <laughs> very nice. And I could put in a backpack uh, to head to South by Southwest the next year, which would be pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, aside from that, and aside from the uh, really nice new iPads, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit of a tidbit of information that uh, uh, Tim Cook gave out, which was the fact that uh, uh, iTunes Radio has now uh, had 20 million users uh, over the past month uh, since they launched, uh, and uh, uh, they streamed uh, about a, mil a billion, uh, over a billion songs. Actually, that's what he said. Uh, so these are big numbers, uh, and they build from the 11 million users that were announced after the first week. Although that's a uh, significant slowdown from from the first week's uh, announcement uh and you know the, the one billion tracks figure i uh, did some maths and it, it, it kind of equates to about 50 tracks per user uh, if i did the math correctly uh in terms of the 20 million users and the one billion tracks which is pretty respectable considering you know the that the service is pretty new so uh i'm interested in seeing what where this is going to go there's so many new devices that have come out from apple like the new ipads the ipad Light, ipad air whatever it is uh the minis the new iphones so there's going to be millions and millions of devices flooding the market uh, over the holiday season i'm just interested in seeing how many of those users are going to adopt itunes radio as their, as their uh internet radio of choice uh, they may have never heard of internet radio before. There's probably uh, quite a few people out there that uh, haven't, even if Pandora is pretty popular. So, yeah, I'm just interested in seeing what's going to happen there. Uh, I don't know, Jules, are you excited to hear that iTunes Radio might come to the UK in January, February, March, Q1? Uh, and do you think that uh, th these numbers are promising for us? 
Yeah, I mean, again, well, I haven't seen it, obviously, because we haven't, uh, we don't have it. haven't had, it, had it over here. Yeah, quite you, can't, you can't even spoof the IP because it's linked to your iTunes account, so this doesn't no, work. No. Exactly. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how it works. Uh, again, you kind of think that's only half the picture if it's, if it's a Pandora-style radio station. You kind of think, well, you kind of want the choice to pick and choose. Right. Because it, it seems like you miss the middle ground. I mean, if you have... You have the radio station, you have the download, but you don't have this, the, the actual choice of streaming something. You know, you, you can't just listen to an album, really, as far as I'm aware, because I haven't, haven't seen it. But um, right. uh, I, I think it's, it's exciting if, if, if they're going to be able to pay the artists okay. Yeah. I think that that's a good thing. I mean, I don't know anything about the deal that they, they might have or, or what cut is going to go to the artists directly or the publishers or the songwriters. So... I, I'm just, I guess, I'll wait and see to see what it's like. I mean, there's obviously yeah. a lot of people who use iTunes, so there's an inbuilt potential market there. But yeah, wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve, on, on your end, uh, have you tried it? And uh, do you like it? How's it going? iTunes Radio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's been out here now for for a month or so, um, yeah. and and I do like it. I mean, I, I'm like everybody. I've been mystified as to sort of what's the difference between this and Pandora. It's a very, very similar service. And really the main difference, and especially when you talk to people in the record industry, is sort of there's a big red button that says that you can buy this, 99 cents or whatever, you know. So that's kind of the key difference. Um, I like it because, like you, Andrea, I'm an Apple guy. You know, I, I like my Apple products and I'm, I'm, you know, perhaps unreasonably, stupidly loyal to them, you know. And just because I've, I've committed to them, you know, I have all these devices and I don't want to get rid of them and get all new ones, you know. So, so um and and I like them, and and I like iTunes Radio, and and um, you know my admit, initial thought upon hearing that uh, they got twenty million customers in in one or listeners in in one week was sort of well maybe here in the U.S. President Obama can team up with Apple to to get some better traction with his healthcare system. <laughs> he, you know, I, I, anything Apple does, it seems to, or, or not anything. I mean, Ping didn't work, you know. Oh, but yeah. uh, but but anything anything Apple does in the music space, it seems like poof. This is suddenly we had this incredible user base, and right. and so that's the power of Apple. Um, you know, as far as far as what I like about iTunes Radio, again, I think it's just sort of take Pandora and put it in the Apple universe where it's right. synced with all your collection and all your music and you can buy stuff and, and it's comfortable. It's Apple. It's, it's got a track record. Uh, that to me is the advantage of it all. Otherwise, you know, I think Pandora is perfectly fine to, for, for people. Yeah, sure. Uh, Alejandro, uh, I mean, I've, I've said this before on the show, I think a few, a few weeks ago, but one of the things that I excite me the most about iTunes radio is the fact that uh, according to the rumors that uh, their deals are uh, allow uh, iTunes Radio to will allow to to them to expand uh, relatively quickly across different territories. Uh, you know, it's a different deal than Pandora's that is completely tied to the compulsory licenses, uh, so to to the sound exchanges of this world. Uh, so they can't expand quite as quickly. Uh, so on the international level. Uh, you were talking about, of course, Apple products being quite expensive, of course, in South America, and so the adoption isn't as great as uh, as one might think. Uh, uh, for an iTunes radio product, do you think that would fly? Uh, I, I, I think it's available for iTunes uh, on Windows as well, for example. So do you think people would be open to trying it out if it's free? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that there's, in spite of the fact that, you know, uh, Apple products are quite expensive here. You know, they got a very loyal fan base such as you guys. I mean, uh, you, you know, pe people who have their entire ecosystems built around the Apple experience. You know, they, you know, they work on Apple. They listen on Apple. They, they, they do all kinds of things on Apple products. And I think that they'd be very excited to actually have the app working for them, you know, yeah. because Pandora is not available here. So that would be a big blow on Pandora if Pandora ever wanted to explore this Latin American market and, you know, they already have those big, big loyal fans who would be willing to back them up on, on the entire iTunes experience. Let's just hope, uh, let's just hope uh, it doesn't take as long as it did the store, you know, because the store took 10 years to get here, <laughs> you know, and people were going nuts because the record industry here disappeared. You know, they, you know, the records, you know, rec record stores, you know, they just vaporized, you know. They they disappeared off the face of this uh, region quite a while ago, and you know the, all the subsidiaries of the big record labels are having a rough time working their frontline products and working their local artists as well because there wasn't a digital platform that could help them out. So it would actually be 
quite a relief for the record companies, quite an interesting experience for all the uh, Mac and the Apple users, and quite an interesting deal also for the competition, for Deezer, for the Rhapsody Napster guys, and for Spotify when it comes in at the end of this year. Absolutely, and yeah, it's going to be interesting to see because, uh, of course, Pandora has been restricted to uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, another four territories, I think, that are in uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and somewhere else, I'm not sure. But yeah, there are in a few territories, but they're not uh, in the UK, for example. So uh, the market here is pretty open to, to something like that coming in and, and doing uh, interesting things. So yeah, we're going to see what, what happens with that. Um, yeah. well, guys, the, the, there's, uh, there's, there's there's one thing I just yeah, want to sure. ask. Of course. Uh, and I want to ask Steve and Jules, and it's regarding their experiences with, with streaming services. Um, because I believe that... You know, Bob Lessitz wrote in a letter that one of the big streaming services is going to win. That there's only going to be one streaming service standing at the end of it all. And I want to ask you guys if you have different streaming services working, uh, if you have different accounts on different uh, services. If you've got like a Spotify account and a Pandora account and an iTunes radio account. And if you are, you know, kind of like if you believe that you know, left sets is right on this issue and what you are going to end up with at the very end, which one of the services you're going to wind up with? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. <laughs> Go ahead, Jules. You first. All right. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, ideally, this would be an ideal world. It would be amazing if there was room and there was enough people for all of them to win. So you could have such huge user base that people had their own choice as to what they'd invested in, in terms of uh, usability for like Deezer or Audio or Spotify and all that stuff, you, you could actually have it in your own little world and there'd be enough people to sustain all three. Probably that's not going to happen and you're probably going to have just one thing. I mean, I, I haven't, I mean, I've got an account with, with Deezer, with Audio and Spotify and I only ever use Spotify. But that's not because I don't like the other services, it's just because that's all I have time to worry about. I mean, no one has time to kind of worry about three different services, I don't think. So yeah. I suspect he's probably right in that one will be the, the overall dominant force, but there's probably going to always be some other ones around. Yeah, no, well said. I, I think that's true too. And I'm the same way, Jules. I mean, even though I cover this stuff and I have accounts for almost everything and, and it's just, it's always so, the poor radio, RDO rather, um, publicity people, you know, how come you never write about RDO? Well, I use Spotify. You know, it's just the one service that, that I use, you know. Yeah. Um, but But I think... I mean, I do think we are getting to the road of one service. Maybe, you know, it's possible that there might be one kind of on-demand service like Spotify and there might be one radio service, whether it's Pandora or iTunes Radio or, or both. I, but yeah, it, it doesn't make sense that we would have like 10 different services that all perform the same function and they're all competing for, for numbers. You know, that, right. that's sort of, I mean, traditionally in markets like that, certainly in the, in the digital music space, that, that has consolidated. Um, you know, I think that what we're seeing, if you sort of look behind the curtain a little bit, is Google, Apple, perhaps Amazon, um, maybe Microsoft, because they're always sort of saying, hey, we're going to do this big digital music thing, and then it never kind of works out. Um, <laughs> something like that, you know, it, it's, that's, the, those guys are, are putting, they're building the bricks of the house, you know, they're, they're laying the foundation to sort of... Um, take over once this market becomes incredibly lucrative, yeah. which everybody's predicting, you know, it may become incredibly lucrative. YouTube is sort of like where the market is right now. I mean, right. every, you know, all the music is on YouTube and YouTube seems to have a, a, a way of, of making money through advertising. So they're sort of the elephant in the room. Um, and YouTube is already owned by Google. So, so, you know, one could al maybe argue that we're sort of almost here at that point, you know, Spotify, is is big, but it's it's not as big as YouTube, and it's it's pretty marginal if you really think about it. Compare in the context of YouTube, yeah. I yeah. do think if I had to predict, and you know, you guys can hold me to this <laughs> down the road, but I do think that <laughs> somebody's going to buy Spotify. Right. Spotify just has. I mean, my understanding of the way Spotify operates is that they just keep getting people investing in the company on a regular basis. And okay, in order to survive this year, we got X million dollars from some outside venture right. capitalist, yeah. whatever. How long are they going to really be able to sustain that, especially when they have these huge high content expenses? And especially when, you know, eventually when the artists and, and the publishers go, you know, Spotify's not giving us enough money and royalties, raise your rates, raise your rates. And there's big protests and everything. Then, then the expenses are going to be even higher, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because, like, VCs usually operate on a five to seven year 
sort of plan and they, they, right. they, they're, they're hoping to exit a company after that, that, that stage. Right. Yeah. And so I know I'm being long winded here, but I guess what I'm by way of answering your question, Alejandro, is, is I think somebody eventually and probably a Google or an Apple or a Microsoft, some big player in the space is going to go. Spotify makes sense. We need a Spotify. Um, and then and there's then going to be so many regulatory problems that we're going to drown in them for months. <laughs> well, that's a whole different issue. But yeah, and so so maybe it won't. You know, maybe maybe Spotify will have to be quote unquote independent for a while. But yeah. but the, the idea is something like Apple kind of taking over a Spotify and integrating it with the iTunes Store as well as iTunes Radio and all the other things that it has in its in its own area. I think is powerful um, and and might be much more powerful in a few years. Right. Yeah, makes absolute sense. And it's a, it's a great way to end the show as well. Uh, guys, it was a pleasure having you on. I want to go around and ask you, uh, what are you up to? Uh, Jules, do you want to start by, uh, you can plug your company or plug uh, some of your artists, so whichever you prefer. Well, what, what am I up to right now? Or? Well, in general, like you, I said, you can plug one of your artists or well, plug the company. I'm going to a fantastic showcase with a, with a band called Youth, uh, yeah. who have just featured on a song by Kilter, um, who's coming out on Ministry of Sound in Australia. And you through a fantastic duo from London. Uh, they got a song called Low that's just been released onto your social media. So, uh, yeah, go and check it out. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, uh, Steve, anything you're on? Well, I might have lunch. Um, <laughs> right. but, uh, <laughs> sorry, okay, nice. It's 11 15 here. But um, no, I, the same as last time, I'm still yeah, working sure. on this, this um, Michael Jackson biography. Massive project. tome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a year into it, and it's a two year project, and I've just hit the early 90s in the chronology, which is sort of when the story shifts away from writing about music yeah. and towards writing about more disturbing things. And so I'm, oh. I'm psychologically making that shift in my mind, and, yeah. and it's uh, it's not a good shift. It and it's, it's all downhill from here, essentially. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like, do I like writing about how Thriller was made, or do I like writing about, you know, how there are these allegations of what crazy, really horrible stuff that happened at Neverland Ranch with all these miscreants and characters and blah, 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 you know. It's a no-brainer for me. But Absolutely. having said that, you know, it's, it's part of the story. And, Absolutely. And it has to be told. Well, we'll see. Yeah, so. Alejandro, uh, on your, your your front, of course, I, I plug the themusicpimp.com and also if we have any Spanish listeners or Spanish speaking listeners, uh, what radio can they find you on uh, if they want to find your show? Yeah, sure. Well, they can find my show on speaker.com Great. and they can find uh, the radio show also on laxmasmusica.com. That's l a x m a s m u s i c a dot com. Great. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much. And I'm going to throw the uh, Twitter handles as well uh, in the show notes so that people can find you on Twitter. Uh, it was a real pleasure having you on. Thanks so much for joining me. And thanks for listening. Uh, D Digital Music Trends uh, happens every week. Uh, so uh, if you like the show, uh, tune in next week as well or subscribe on uh, one of the many channels that, that are, are available. Uh, SoundCloud, I mentioned, uh, MixCloud, uh, uh, YouTube, uh, and of course, iTunes. Uh, that's uh, something that I forgot to mention, but it's uh, still one of the main uh, ways that people listen to the show with uh, so uh, thanks so much for listening have a great week and until next time and that's all for this week i really hope you enjoyed the show check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter